this city. God, we thank you for planting us here to see you glorified through your people, through your creation. God, we ask that as we gather, as we lift up our praises, Lord God, we think of every street, every neighborhood, every school, every block, that your light may shine through it. God, may your people magnify you. May they magnify your goodness, Lord. Every teacher, every student, every parent, every grandparent, every generation, every culture that is here, Lord. Lord, your love is over all nations, God. We thank you that in this city, God, you planted us. God, we thank you so much. We pray that you are glorified. Amen. Hey, all raps, welcome. Welcome, everybody. We're going to keep this praise party going. And uh, as our way of getting to know the people in this space, we like to invite everyone to bring their phones out, take a selfie, meet a new friend. Don't forget to hashtag Saturday Selfie and tag us at onrampschurch.org. The band's going to be vibing. We ask that you go on, go and stand up. Meet someone across the room, across the building, maybe next to you. upon my heart I will dance like David dance hey. the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart I will dance like David dance upon my heart I will dance like David dance Come on. the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart upon my heart I will praise like David prays when the spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart I will praise like David Lord comes upon my heart. 
wanna dance? Do you wanna dance? Do you wanna dance? upon my heart. Come on! When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon my heart, I will dance like David. David! I will dance! 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 Like David! God is in this place, amen. God is moving, amen. Welcome everyone to On Ramps Covenant Church. We've got some exciting things happening in the life of On Ramps, not only as a church body, but within as well too. Um, and at this time, and I'm gonna give some, gonna give them some time. Um, just uh, we want to thank you all uh, to be a part of uh, our gathering here today. You all can, for, uh, are welcome to take a seat. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the worship team for creating this space. They're going to continue um, guiding and, and weaving the moving of the Spirit. Um, it is really a gift to be able to worship here to, together. Uh, for those of you that are, are new, I'll say, welcome to the table. Welcome to the table. We are entering a exciting exciting and engaging season of uh, engaging scripture through the lens of looking at the table uh, that the Lord invites us to. Um, so uh, we are going to continue in this, in this time as uh, when Pastor Phil comes up to, to give his message uh, today, but also um, in our times of, uh, of, of song through song. As we minister to one another, we're inviting each other um, to, to move, to be led by the Spirit, to move into a posture where we give God access to the things that are yet, the things that have been revealed or things that are yet to be revealed in our lives. Amen? Because we're not, we're not finished products. Yes, the work of what God has done, soul, is finished, but there's still a lot of work that we're going through, yeah? You know, I mean, like this week, like a lot of people say, it's like, I had a week and it's only been like a day. You know, but when life happens, life be happening, life be lifing, but we got a good God that doesn't stop loving. Amen. It's a transformative love um, that we get to experience. And so, Lord, we, um, we want to continue in this space. God, we want to thank you that you invite us to meet you at the table. Lord, you invite us to know your love. You invite us to be near to you. So God, we thank you. God, we thank you for this time.
For some of us, we are, we are crawling with our heads down, hearts heavy full of shame. Lord, Lord, remind us that your love never changed for us. Lord, remind us that the burdens we carry that we can release unto you. Lord, remind us that there is freedom, that there is freedom. Amen.
Good evening on ramps. Tonight is very special for us for so many reasons. One of the reasons it's so special is because tonight we get to dedicate two young boys that are beloved by us all. And uh, so tonight I want to invite uh, Joelle and Johnny Murray to bring their parents up here, please. Brandon and Jessica, would you join me? And Brandon, you've got a couple of things, I think, uh, with you as well. Wonderful. So I'm going to ask, yes, absolutely. Just have a seat up front, if you would, please. Tremendous. Brandon, I'm going to take those from you there. Thank you. There are some photos you'll see on the screen here tonight. Um, these are very, very special. Um, I just absolutely love these boys. Um, they are my nephews, and I am so honored to be their uncle. I, um, I wanted to just share a couple of quick things, if I may. Um, First of all, tonight we are, uh, yeah, just, why don't, you know what, why don't you enjoy those? They're just too cute, right? They're too cute. Too cute. Too cute. Too cute. Too cute. Um, tonight, I wanted to do a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, it is absolutely amazing to be able tonight to dedicate these boys. What it means to dedicate uh, a child to the Lord, or in this case, both sons. Uh, it is to acknowledge and recognize that as parents, that, um, that they are going to need the Lord over the course of their lifetime. It's an acknowledgement by mom and dad that the best gift they can give these boys, their sons who they love so much, is the gift of a relationship with Jesus. And while these boys are going to have to choose that relationship over time, while these boys are going to have to make a decision over time to fall in love with Jesus, to respond to his love for them, to choose to follow him, tonight is really an acknowledgement that God has been involved in their lives from the beginning. The Bible says that before you were born, I knew you. And so these beautiful boys, these young men, these boys that are growing up to be someday men in our community who are going to represent what it means to love God as a man, to be a, a brother, to be a cousin, someday to probably be an uncle, they are nephews. They are sons. Someday, God willing, if it's his will, they'll be husbands. Perhaps they'll even be fathers. Maybe even grandfathers someday. Isn't that something to think about? These young boys. And so, and so when, is it, when is it time to begin to shape them? When is it, when is it time to invest in them? When is, when is the time to begin to say to them, uh, you, you, my son, you are valuable. You are loved. You, you cherish others. You honor others. You love others. When does that time come? When should you start that? You should start it right now. You should start it, mom. You should start it. You should start it before they're born. And I know that John and Soul, I know that they've done that. I know that when they were in Soul's womb, I know that that work began. I know this loving family has been praying for these boys from the beginning. And so um, tonight, I want to just read a couple of passages of Scripture. Um, these passages were selected by mom and dad. I'm going to read these uh, over both... Johnny and Joel, Numbers chapter 6, starting at verse 24. 
says the following to these young men. Johnny and Joel, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord smile down on you and show you his kindness. May the Lord answer your prayers, Joel. And Johnny, may he give you peace. I want to um, read one other passage. This is um, out of the book of Psalms. This is uh, Psalm number 32, um, line number 8, says the following. The Lord says, I will teach you and guide you in the way you should live. I will watch over you and be your guide. Tonight, I'm going to ask Brandon and Jessica to pray for these boys. Brandon and Jessica are our next-gen co-directors. I'm going to come alongside and anoint the boys tonight. Joel Arturo Murray and Jonathan Wayne Murray III, these incredible young boys. We're going to just pray for them. And as Brandon and Jessica pray for them, I'm going to invite you to extend your hands toward these boys and toward their parents and just pray your own prayer for these precious children. Let us pray. Father God, we are so grateful for the gift of life, for the ability to raise up children who love you, who are called by you. Father, would you bless these boys? Lord, would you bless them to have hearts filled with love, filled with peace. Father, would you raise them up to be men of integrity, men of valor. Lord, raise them up to, to know who you are, how to share your love and your kindness, and how to stand up for someone who can't stand up for themselves. Father, may these boys be emotionally healthy. May they be able to navigate their feelings. May they be comforted when they cry. May they be encouraged to share. May they learn to be vulnerable for the health and wellness of their souls. So Father, would you bless Johnny? Would you bless Jojo? Would you keep them close in your arms? Would you keep them near? to you and father would you help us as the church may we be the ones to come up uh, come alongside them to help guide them and show them your ways and lord may they discover their purpose may they know who they are may they find their identity in you father we are grateful for their life we are grateful for their parents for John and for soul. Lord, we are grateful and we say yes and amen to coming alongside them, walking with them on this journey of raising their sons. So Father, give us grace. Give us your mercy. Help us to love and to cherish this family as you love and cherish us. Heavenly Father, I pray for every teacher that is going to speak life into them. I pray that it always be rooted in truth and it come from you, Father. I pray for every single educator that is going to come to every single school establishment that they will be in. Father, will you give them grace and mercy and will you give them favor and a territory that they will step onto each and every campus, the playgrounds and the classrooms and the, 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 the principals and the administration that they'll be able to influence, Father. Will you give them a way to be able to change the culture of the school just by a single step onto their school campus, Father. I pray, God, 
God, that these will be men of wisdom, Father, that they, yes, will learn wisdom from the educational system, but they will also be wisdom that comes from you, Father, that these will be men that have the scriptures open each and every night, Father, that every night that they will go uh, to sleep, that they will rest their head, it will be wisdom literature that just flows through their minds, Father, that they will not go to sleep with fear or terror or anything like that, Lord, that, but that they will truly be men that will learn to take every thought captive and make it obedient unto you, Father, that these will be men that with every breath that they take, that they will acknowledge that this is just borrowed breath and borrowed time, Father, so they will truly be about their father's business, Lord, that these will be men that when they say, I couldn't find you, they will be, didn't you know that I was in my father's house? Lord, I pray, Father, we know that your word says that you will never leave us nor forsake us, Father, and I know that you will not depart from these boys, Father, but I pray, God, that they're, that they will not depart from you. I pray that everywhere that they go, that they will be a light, my Lord. Let these boys be a light everywhere that they go. God, I pray for soul. As a mother who carried life in her womb, every ounce of sweat, blood, and tears that has ever been shed from her, will you pour back in as she continues to pour out and raise these boys to be men of integrity, men of godly character. Men know that they are, they are men of valor, that they are men who are fully covered in the full armor of God, with full coverage from the head all the way down to their feet. And that each and every day that they will know and grow to understand that they have the sword in their hand. And that will be the only thing that they need in this world. God, I pray for the community of friends that will come alongside of them. Will you remove the plans of the enemy that will try to seep into their lives through friendships and people that will try to cause discord or try to make them go off course of the mission that you have sent them on, Lord. I pray, God, for every friendship. I pray, God, for every relationship. I pray, God, for every neighbor that is going to be in their neighborhood and even in this community. May we be ones to be living our life that is according to your word so that these boys will grow up to always be able to say, I had an example of a godly marriage. I had an example of a godly community. I had an example of godly friendships. So I know the manner in which I am supposed to live because I saw the example for it. I saw the example through my parents. I pray a special hedge of protection and covering over the, their parents' marriage, Lord. Will you bind them together and let no man separate what you have brought together? Lord, we love you, we thank you, we glorify you for what you already started back when they were in soul's womb to today and every plan that you have moving forward. Let your plans unravel right before their eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. And so um, Johnny and Joel, we got you some gifts, okay? And so, uh, so Jess and Brandon are gonna bring them to you now. Yeah, Johnny, look, we got you gifts. Look at that. It's not even your birthday. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's, that's the salient question. I mean, that's, that's, that's what's key. What is it? All right, so we got a couple Bibles for the boys, okay? And so they're going to enjoy those. And mom and dad will read to them. And the boys, of course, will read uh, to themselves as they grow up. And so these Bibles are special. They're from your church community. And we hope that you enjoy them, okay, guys? All right, you all. Can you all just give it up one more time? Celebrate the Lord. It's awesome. I want to invite up uh, all of Journey uh, up here tonight, please. All of Journey, all of Journey. So this is, these are going to be our kindergartners through sixth graders. Come on up. If you're in kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, come on up here right now. There we go. Come on, Olivia. I see you, girl. All right. Come on. Kindergartners through sixth graders. Come on up, Brandon. Come on up. Oh, thank you. Not right now. Okay. All right. So we're going to just uh, pray for all of our children tonight as they head off to journey.
And Jess, um, is our space staying or you want them to release? Okay, got it. Very good. So I'm going to ask you, family, to just extend your hands toward these beautiful children as well tonight. And we're going to release them tonight. All right, let me pray. So, Father, thank you for these wonderful children. Uh, We bless you, God, for them, for their lives. They are precious to you. Um, Father, you said to suffer all of the little children to come to you because of how much you love them, how much potential and destiny you see in them. Everything that you intend to do in them, God, we pray that you would do it and that there would be no weapon that is formed against them that will ever be able to prosper. We give you glory, God, for them now. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let us together say amen, amen, amen. All right, so you all going to follow Mr. Brandon. You see my guy Brandon back there? Y'all go find him. Oh, thank you. All right, you all have a great night. Bye, Journey. You did. LJ, here you go. All right, you all. My beautiful, beautiful family, it is wonderful to be with you tonight as we spend just a few minutes this evening continuing to talk about in the middle of this sermon series, the idea or the invitation rather, welcome to the table. Turn to somebody and say, welcome to the table. Find somebody else next to you and say, welcome to the table. This is our sermon series this month that is welcome to the table. I'm going to ask you to find Luke chapter 14 in your Bibles, Luke chapter 14. Tonight, we are going to uh, focus on, this is going to be a part one of a two-part subject over the next two weeks. This is part one. It's Jesus at the table. And so we're going to talk about what it is to have Jesus at the table out of Luke chapter 14. Last week, LJ shared that uh, God has invited us all to the table. For those of you that were here last week, LJ began to help us to understand that there is a table that Jesus has set, and that we are all invited. Turn to somebody and say, welcome to the table. Yes, yes, you. You are invited to this table. You are invited. Yes, yes. You and all your sin invited to this table. Yes, you and all your brokenness invited to this table. Yes, you and all of the times that you've been unfaithful, Jesus still extends his invitation to you and says, welcome to the table. All the parties that I didn't get invited to. (laughs) But Jesus always invites us to the table. His arms are stretched open. His arms are stretched wide. And he says, you, my brother, you, my sister, you, my son, you, my daughter, you are welcome at my table. Last week, LJ shared that God has invited us all to the table. The table is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for the life. For life in the kingdom of God. It's it's a symbol of how life is supposed to be lived in the church. Did you know that? That the table is symbolic of how we are supposed to live together in the church. I think it would be good for you if you haven't already sort of taken pause to be present tonight to those around you. To just sort of observe who is in, uh, is in, who is gathered tonight and who's at this table. If you haven't sort of taken your head and, and moved it on the swivel of your neck and your spine and began to sort of, you know, take those eyes of yours and just sort of move them from the left and to the right like you're at the optometrist and just sort of, you know, just kind of say, man, that, like look at who is at the, this is just 
a, 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 a representation of who's at the table. The table is much broader than this. There are more seats at Jesus' table than are here tonight. But look at who is at the table. Jesus has invited all of us to his table. Turn to somebody and tell them, welcome to the table. You are invited to this table. And this table is a symbol of how life is supposed to be lived in the church. The church is a foretaste. It is a, a representation of what life is to be like in the kingdom of God. When you try to understand uh, what it is to be in God's kingdom, you should be able to come and look at the church and say, ah, oh, that's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to be done. That's how you live uh, in community when you don't understand each other. That's how you extend grace to each other when you disagree. That's what it looks like to be able to extend mercy when someone has done you wrong. This is what it looks like. What do you mean what does it look like? Just go to the church because in the church, this is where you get to visibly, tangibly observe how God's kingdom functions. And it's around this table that we get to see that. Because when the church is salt and light, it's not just about people coming and coming to the church and becoming part of this community. This community is training ground so that people begin to understand how deep and how wide and how long and how high God's love is for us. This is where you discover what unconditional love feels like. Now I'm the first to confess, I'm the first to confess that we, the church, do not always get that right. We, the church, sometimes throw in the trash some invitations that God himself has extended. That we ourselves sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally do not put postage on the invitations that God wanted sent in the mail to people who were supposed to have received his invitation. We sometimes get it wrong. And I don't know about your family. I'm sure your family is much healthier than my family. But in my family, there have been times where we've had some parties. We've invited people to the celebration. We, we said, hey, why don't you come? And when they came, they didn't feel welcomed. In my family, they came and they got offended that day. In my family, they came and, and we just didn't have quite enough food for everybody. I'm sure your family is much healthier than mine. But in my family, and yes, even sometimes in our church family, we, we get it wrong. Sometimes in our church family, people come and they don't feel welcome. Sometimes people come to this church family and they, they get their feelings hurt. It's not because there's anything wrong with them. and There's not necessarily because you meant to do it or we meant to do it. It just happens because we're broken people. And I've told you, I've shared with you very openly recently in the last number of months that I've been sort of facing and confronting my own brokenness. I've been in therapy. I've told you this. Because I'm trying to understand me. I'm trying to understand why, why I become, over time, kind of emotionally distant. I'm trying to understand why, in the course and context of, of, of pastoring and, and in my, with my kids and, and with my wife and with my parents and with my friends and with people that I love, that they don't always leave an interaction with me feeling loved. They leave an interaction with me feeling like I just conducted a business transaction. And I'm trying to understand that about myself. And that kind of a relationship can hurt people's feelings. I don't mean to do it, but I've done it in the past. And so I'm trying to do, do that work. And so, yes, in the church, sometimes, sometimes people come and your brokenness spills out onto them. My brokenness spills out onto them. 
And so, and so we, but when we get it right, and by the grace of God, when we are salt and when we are light, this kind of love, this kind of hospitality, the life around this table begins to be manifested in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our country, and across the world. This is how God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, hey, you are invited. You are invited. We, we, doesn't it feel good to be invited? No one likes to not be invited. It feels so good to know that, that, that we, that we love a God and are loved by a God who invites us to the table. He says, I know you. I know you coming and I know you going. I know the number of hair on your head. I, you see, I said hair. It was just like because there's some of us. Anyway, y'all, anyway. So, you know, I, I, know, I know how you struggle. I know where your pain points are. I know what happens to you when you're under pressure. I know how you are stressed out right now. But I'm still calling you. And I'm saying, come, come, come. There's a seat for you, Jesus says, at my table. We are invited to the table. And tonight as we explore Luke chapter 14, we're going to find that Jesus actually in Luke chapter 14 introduces us to four different tables. Four tables that, that illuminate how life is supposed to be when we gather around the table that Jesus has set. These four tables are going to give some definition to what we might refer to as table fellowship. Can you say table fellowship? Table fellowship. You know, years ago, I used to run this nonprofit organization. It was called the Fresno Institute for Urban Leadership. And, um, and, and, and we used to run this thing called the Pink House. Pink House is still in existence. Uh, and we got some Pink House alum in the house tonight. Um, and, 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 and so we had some. And so the Pink House, every year, at the beginning of the year, they'd, 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 they would accept all of these college-age students into the house. It was a beautiful kind of uh, example of what it is to invite people to the table. And so, so they'd accept all these people into the house, and they would say, hey, you're going to live together for nine months. Strangers, you're going to live together for nine months, and you're going to study Scripture. And you're going to serve in the community. And, and one of the very first things they would do to start the year off, one of the very first things they would do is they would do what was called, in our neighborhood, in this neighborhood, they called a, a progressive dinner. A progressive dinner. Fascinating concept. And what they would do is, is they would set up in advance. They'd set up appetizers at, let's say, uh, Seth and Sam's house in the neighborhood. And then, and then they would set up, um, you know, sort of uh, like, like um, they would do maybe kind of the first course of dinner, you know, maybe at Jesus and Anna's house. And then the third, and then the second dinner course, you know, maybe, maybe they would set it up at, at Tish and Malachi's house. And then they would, they would schedule dessert, you know, maybe, maybe at Bud's house. And, and they would have all of these students, this progressive dinner, they would go first to Seth and Sam's house and they would have appetizers. And they'd spend time sharing life and listening to stories and learning from each other. Then they'd get up and they'd walk down the street and they'd, they'd end up at Jesus and Anna's house for for the first course of, of dinner. And then, then they share stories and they listen to Jesus and on and they get to know each other. And then they'd make their way, of course, to the second course of dinner at Tish and Malachi's house and, and they would do more of the same. And then finally they would, they would kind of cap the night with dessert over at Bud's house. It was a progressive dinner. One night, 
One night, meal to meal, house to house. Tonight, we're going to participate in our own version of a progressive dinner. Going from table to table to table to table in Luke chapter 14. Is that all right with you? And so tonight, if we're going to start this progressive dinner, we have to start really not, not at, 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 kind of in the middle of the passage, which is where we're going to end up tonight. We can't really start at verse 15. We're, we're going to have to actually kind of go to some preceding verses. We, we actually, if you have Luke chapter 14 handy and available, we're going to have to start at verse number 1. At the beginning of what uh, some Bible students, when we look at Luke chapter 14, Bible students might refer to as the beginning of our pericope. Can you say pericope? A pericope is sort of a unit of scripture that is intended to be held together for interpretive purposes. In other words, if you start at verse 15, you only capture two tables. But if you start at verse 1 and go all the way to verse 24, you find that there are actually four tables. And so in order to understand table 3 and table 4, you've got to start with table 1 and table 2. And in order to understand table 1 and table 2, you have to include table 3 and table 4. And so we're going to start at verse number 1 in Luke chapter 14. This is where we find our first table. Somebody call out table number 1. Table 1. I used to work at a restaurant once upon a time. They never let me be a server. I just I was a I was a I was a busboy. I was in college and I was a busboy. I'm a little sour about that, that they never let me be a server. Is there still time? <laughs> There's still time. I got so sour, I was so upset, I left that employer, that restaurant, to go to another restaurant where they say I'd be a server. I got over there to that other restaurant, and they made me a busboy. <laughs> I'm still, I don't know why I didn't qualify to be a server. I don't know. Table number one. I feel like I could have done it. Um, all right, table number one. Table number one, we find Jesus. We find Jesus at table number one. Jesus himself is seated at table number one. I want to read this to you. It says, one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, Jesus healed him and sent him on his way. At table number one, we find Jesus seated at the table where we learn the, the purpose of, of table fellowship, the purpose of table fellowship when Jesus is your guest. At table number one, we learn that healing happens at the table. This is why 13 years ago, God called On Ramps Covenant Church to be a healing community healing our community because we understand that as we seek to embody the gospel of Jesus, as we seek to live as a kingdom community, as we seek to express love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and hospitality, as we seek to do these things one to another, we understand that this table isn't just about the food that's served here. This table 
is where healing happens. You see, healing always happens when you are seated at the table that Jesus is also seated at. Because wherever Jesus is, all of heaven is too. You, you can't sit across from Jesus and not know that you have access to all of heaven's healing. You cannot be this near to Jesus and not recognize that you are in the presence of the one that has your deliverance. You cannot draw close to Jesus and be in his presence and not know that you are sitting just feet away from your own healing and your own salvation and your own redemption. Where Jesus is seated, heaven is present. And so you can't come to this table and just be here and say, I just came to get a little word tonight. You can't come to this table and just be like, I just came for the cookies and the punch at the cafe hour. You can't just show up at this table and not recognize that you are in the presence of the one who can turn your life around in a moment. At this table, Jesus was seated there and he was seated across from a man whose body was swelling and the Pharisees who were sitting there, all they intended to do was to watch Jesus carefully. But Jesus was sitting there and he saw this man's pain. He saw his hurt. He saw that he is in need of healing. And Jesus said, come here, young man. I need to heal. I don't care if it's the Sabbath. I don't care what they think. If you are here and you have a need, I have come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. God will withhold no good thing from those that love him and are called according to his purpose. I don't know what you need tonight. But I need you to know that you are in the presence of the King of Kings. You are in the presence of the Lord of Lords. You are in the presence of the one who can change everything in a moment. I don't care why you came. I need you to know that wherever you are, you are now seated at the table with Jesus. You thought you came for dinner. No, you came for your healing. You just didn't know it. You thought you came for some steak and mashed potatoes. No, you came to get delivered. You, you, you thought you came just for the, for the raspberry cheesecake. No, no, no. You came in order to get your miracle. You have no idea what is possible when you sit next to Jesus. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or imagine God is able to do it turn to somebody and tell them God is able God is able in table number one we learn that healing happens somebody say table number two table number two don't try and take my job I'm still trying to become a server. Y'all try to show me up. I don't appreciate that. Table number two. Table number two is found at a wedding feast. Let's, let's go there. Let's go there. Let's go there. Let's go there. I love this. Um, 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 verse number eight. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you'll have to take the least important place at the table. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up. Somebody say move up. Yeah. Move up. Anybody know the Jeffersons? Y'all don't know. All right. All right. Here we go. Moving on up. All right. So um, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Table number two is found at a wedding feast. Where we learn, where we 
are to sit at the table. You're invited. There's a seat for you. At the table is where we do more than just serve dinner. This is the place where healing happens. When you get there, table number two instructs us, instructs us where to sit. And so it's a challenge. It's complex. It's, it's confounding because there are no tent cards at the table settings. Your name isn't on any of the settings. You come in and it's a large table. And there's seats all around it. It's, you were invited, but you're not quite sure where you're supposed to sit. It's not one of those kinds of, of invitations where, where you walk in and you just look for your name. Your name is not to be found at any of the place settings. There are no reserved seats. There are simply surrendered hearts. When you come to this table, you sit wherever you please. But Jesus says at this table, it's better to be exalted than it is to be humbled. I want to just say to all the brothers in here, every man who never felt like they were worth much, every man who has been fighting just to find their dignity, we are often the ones who exalt ourselves because there have been people in our lives who said, you are not man enough. I want to tell you that in the kingdom, when you walk with Jesus, the path to being exalted is not exalting yourself. The path to being exalted, the path to moving on up is the path of humility. And so, and so at this table, Jesus says it's better, it's better to be exalted by the host than it is to be humbled by the host. It's better to be called than it is to be directed. It's better to be humble than it is to be haughty. At this table, brothers and sisters, we always make room near the head of the table. Listen, we do it so that those who need to sit nearest to Jesus are able to. We always make room at the head of the table so that those who need to sit nearest to Jesus are always able to. It's one of the things that makes me a little bit angry about the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She had been battling this issue for over a decade, y'all. And, 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 and people in her village knew her. She was known. They knew she was battling this issue for 12 years. They knew that she was trying to, every way she could to get healed. And when Jesus came to her village, if this were on ramps, someone would have come to get her and brought her straight to Jesus before anybody else got there. But in her village, they all crowded around Jesus, trying to touch him and, and see what they could see. They wanted, they were spectators and, and they were watchers and they were looky-loos. And, 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 and this woman, she had to push her way through the crowd to get to Jesus, to get the healing that her village knew she desperately needed. It makes me mad that she had to push her way through her fellow villagers, just to get the healing they knew she desperately needed. Just to touch the hem of his garment, she had to fight. I don't know about you, but I already know that I can't live without Jesus. He's the only answer I've 
got. He's the only solution in my life to my problems. He's the only one that has the power to solve every situation that I'm facing. I already know that he's the only one that can see me through my struggles. So like the apostle said, Jesus is my all in all, y'all. <laughs> all right, he didn't say the y'all part, but, but yo, he said, G, Paul said, he's my all in all. I know that. I know he's everything that I need. I know I can't find healing anywhere else. I know I can't find peace anywhere else. I know I can't be delivered from any other source. I know that I need Jesus. So when someone comes to on-ramps who's trying to figure out if Jesus is real, when someone comes to on-ramps and they're like, man, I'm just here just to check a box. When somebody comes to on-ramps and they're like, man, I've been to church all my life. It's the same old, same old. When someone comes to on-ramps and they're trying to see if Jesus can actually turn their life around, you don't have to tell me twice because I already know what Jesus can do. I already know that he's my all in all. I already know that he's the only answer I've got. So you don't have to tell me twice if I see you and I know that you came and you're struggling and I, you came and you're doubting and you came and you're not sure and you came and your faith is weak and you came and you need an answer and you came and you need a miracle. I'm getting up out of my seat and I'm like, hey, you can have my seat, brother. I'll stand right back. If I got to stand, I'm okay because I don't need Jesus when I get here. I get up at 4 a.m. every morning to spend an hour with Jesus. I don't need him when I get here. If you came and you're struggling, you can have my seat. You can have my seat. And so at table number two, we learn who gets the best seats. It's those who need to be the closest to Jesus, who didn't get that time with him this morning, who haven't felt his presence in a few years, who been battling an ailment for a decade. They get the best seat. Which takes us to table number three. Somebody say, table number three. That was better, thank you. That, that was much better. I felt like I was stood out amongst the crowd in that moment. If there was a restaurant manager that was looking to hire somebody, I feel like they might have called my name first. I appreciate that very much. Table number three, table number three, table number three. Let's go to table number three. Verse number 12, then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, oh, that's interesting. He turns to us and he says, when you give a luncheon or a dinner. Remember, table number one, Jesus was at a prominent Pharisee's house. Jesus was seated at the table. Jesus was the guest of the Pharisee. At table number two, it was a different scenario. At table number two, um, he began to uh, talk about a wedding feast. And at the wedding feast, people were seated and they started to exalt themselves. And they started to, to find the special seats and the prominent seats. And Jesus said, if you exalt yourself, you'll be humbled. But if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. Table number one was in a prominent Pharisee's house. Table number two was at a wedding feast. Table number three says, if you, if you host in your home, a lunch or a dinner. He says, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. I don't know where he lived. Um, <laughs> if you do, they may invite you back. Huh. If you do, they may invite you back. And so you will be repaid but when you give a banquet invite the poor the crippled the lame the blind and you will be blessed although they cannot repay you you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous at table number three Family, we learn why we serve. 
Earlier today, Jessica and Lindsay was not feeling well tonight. Jessica and Lindsay hosted a training here at the Impact Center for those who helped to facilitate our worship gatherings like this. And throughout the training, I just kept hearing people say, I serve, I serve because I love my community. It's why I serve. I, I, I don't do it for any other reason. I serve because I love my community. You see, when God places it on your heart to serve, you don't serve because you're going to get something in return. At the tables that I sit at, my city job, people always come to the table because they're looking for something. But when you serve in the kingdom of God, this is the only way that it works. You come to serve expecting nothing in return. You serve because you love the people that you are serving. You see, this is really the story of Mary and Martha when Jesus came over to their house. This is really the story. You see, Mary and Martha, you, you might remember, they had invited Jesus over for a meal. Jesus says in Luke 14, when you invite folks over, just, you know, they invite him over for a meal. And, and as they're preparing the meal, Martha got upset because Mary wasn't helping with the meal. Mary went, sat at Jesus' feet, loved him, worshipped him, wept at his feet. Martha, on the other hand, was in the kitchen and she was doing all the preparations. This is really the story, you see. You see, when you serve people out of love, when you serve your spouse, when you serve your children, when you serve your brother or your sister, when you serve your, your aging parents, when you serve those that are in here tonight, when our elders serve you tonight, when mama and the hospitality crew served you at 5 p.m., and Michael and mama Josie, when they serve you, they serve you because they don't need anything back from you. They serve you because they love you. And when you serve out of love, sometimes you'll stop serving just to love. Because there's not enough love flowing in your service. Sometimes the service is so demanding that you can't, you can't love and serve. And so Mary stopped and just said, forget all this food stuff. I just want to go be with you, Jesus. And Martha said, oh, I got to finish the meal while Jesus was sitting there not receiving hospitality that she really wanted to convey. It's the story of Mary and Martha. Jesus said, I want you to do this. I want you to invite people to the table who can't repay you because if you do that, I will teach you how to love. Because if you invite people to the table who cannot love you, cannot repay you, cannot do anything for you, then it positions your heart from the beginning to just serve because you love. You expect nothing, you're going to get nothing, but, but if you do so, Jesus says, then you will be blessed and you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Apostle Paul says that if you're going to serve, you have to do it with pure love. He says anything else doesn't count. You can speak in tongues, but it's just like clanging cymbals. If there isn't love, when our gatherings commence. He says you can prophesy when you gather and have faith that moves mountains, but if you don't have love, he says, we are nothing. He says, we can give everything we have to the poor. 
hear me. You can invite all the right people, but if the posture of your heart is not right, if we don't have love, then we gain nothing. When we gather around this table every week, we gather then in love. What then does love look like? It's patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It never dishonors anybody. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil. It only rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and it always perseveres. If you come to 1955 Broadway Street on a Tuesday or a Saturday night and you don't feel love, then the table we have set is not a kingdom table. If you come to 1955 Broadway Street on a Tuesday or on a Saturday night and are not compelled to love others because of the love you have received, the welcome you have received, the hospitality you have received, the joy you have received, then the table we have set is not a kingdom table. At table number three, sisters and brothers, we learn why we serve. Which brings us to table number four. It is our final table. Somebody say table number four. Table number four. Table number four. That was good, Jackie. Table number four. It is the largest table of all. Verse number 16. Jesus said, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room at the table. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, and I want you to get this, this whole time the, the, the master was speaking directly to the servant. Servant, go do this. Servant, go do that. This last line. Remember where Jesus is. Do you remember table number one? Where was Jesus at table number one? In a prominent Pharisee's house gathered around a table with other Pharisees. It was a wealthy, elite group that had gathered for that meal, all there to carefully watch Jesus. Carefully, I'm glad they were carefully watching Jesus because when it comes to table number four, they need to see what Jesus is doing. Comes to table number four, Jesus still sitting in that same house where he has been sharing about the wedding feast, where he's been saying, if you host your own dinner or lunch, this is who I want you to invite. Saying at this Pharisee's house, he now gets to table number four and he says this, shares this parable about this great master who had all of these folks. It was a great banquet, prepared this great meal, invited all these great people. And these great people all turned down the meal after they had already RSVP'd, after they'd already said, I'm coming. After they already said, I'll be there. They all of a sudden say to Jesus, I can't come. I just bought some oxen. I can't come. I just bought some land. I can't come. I just got married. 
the master got angry and says to his servant, Servant, I want you to go to the alleys and the streets and the corners. I want you to go find the crippled, the lame, the poor, the blind. I want you to invite them. The servant says, Sir, I already did that. We still have room at the table. He said, I want you to go back out and I want you to go compel them to come. And then the last verse, he says this, I tell you, you don't see it here. You don't see it. But that word, you, it is not singular. He is no longer speaking to his servant. He doesn't say, I tell you. That word, you, is plural. Jesus now picks up his head in the house of that prominent Pharisee, sitting around the table with all those prominent elite Pharisees, he picks up his head, he looks around the room, and he says, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Sitting around this table, you think you got an invitation because your buddy invited you to this table to come and sit with the guy that's walking around Galilee streets performing miracles and declaring that, that he's the son of God. Some people say I'm the Messiah. Some people say that I'm the one you've been waiting for. And you came to carefully watch me. I'm glad you're watching. Because I tell you, Not any of these folks who had RSVP'd, who had already committed to come, not one of them will get a taste of my banquet. Who is at the banquet table? The poor, the lame, the crippled, the blind. At table number four, it is prepared to be a great banquet. And it's here that we learn who we are to invite to the table fellowship. I love that after being disappointed in this parable, the master doesn't just throw away the meal he had prepared. I'm glad that after being disrespected by his guests, that he doesn't just feed the fine food to his oxen. I'm glad that after being discarded and offended, that the master doesn't just sit down, say, well, I'm just going to eat as much as my stomach can take. I'll put the rest in the refrigerator for tomorrow. But instead, the master who had prepared a great banquet pivots. And he does something that was completely radical. He breaks every social norm and he says to his servant, I've prepared a great meal. Go to the streets and find every poor, every crippled, every lame, every blind person you can find and invite them to sit at my table. Pastor Reese and I we broke a social norm when almost 20 years ago we decided to live in this neighborhood. Greg and Barb Fisk moved in this neighborhood years before we did. They broke a social norm. Jesus and Anna could live anywhere they want to. They choose to live in this neighborhood. They've broken a social norm. And there are many others in here who continue to choose to break social norms in order that you can embody the kingdom of God where you are. That you can set a table that looks like Jesus' table where the hospitality of Jesus and the fellowship of the kingdom can be conveyed around a beautiful meal. 
And so at table number four, we learn that the kingdom table is not a kingdom table unless all who are in the kingdom are invited. It is not a kingdom table unless all who are in the kingdom are invited. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Tonight, I'm going to invite you to do something that we often do at on-ramps. And it's going to take us just a little bit past the 7.30 hour, but not much, because we're going to be quick. But I want to give you just a moment to just respond and reflect to the four tables that Jesus introduces in Luke chapter 14. I want to remind you briefly what they are. At table number one, at table number one, we learn that at this table, healing happens. This is more than just coming to the table. This is the place where you are transformed. At table number two, we learn where we sit at the table. Not to exalt ourselves, but to be humble. Because those that exalt themselves will be humbled, and those that are humble will be exalted. At table number three, we learn why we serve. We serve because we love. And at table number four, we learn who to invite to the table. This is not a kingdom table unless all those who are in the kingdom are invited. I want to ask you to respond to these two questions. We're going to focus on table number four for our conversation. And yes, we're just going to talk. So for those of you that are new to on-ramps, welcome to on-ramps. This is what we do. So at the end of our gathering tonight, I wanted to invite you to share this. So I want to get you, invite you to get into groups like four or five and answer these questions. Who generally in our neighborhood and city have been marginalized from the table of kingdom community? Who generally is not invited to the table? Second question. Who specifically, generally, now specifically, could you invite to the table to experience table fellowship and kingdom community? All right? So I'm going to invite you just to turn around in your chairs and just have a conversation. I don't care, you know, which question you focus on. You're welcome to do both. But groups of four or five would be best or the, or the conversation will get too large. So groups of four or five, please. And just want to invite you to just respond to these two questions. All right, sisters and brothers. Let me just pray for us, actually, in the interest of time. I'm just going to pray for us. So, Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you teach us and you shape us to reflect God, the table that you set for us and the table that you invite us all to. Thank you that, God, when we come to this table, that we, that we seek to honor you. We seek to reflect your love and your hospitality and your goodness and your mercy. God, I pray that we, as a community, would be able to reflect your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. God, bless the on-ramps. Bless the church more broadly in the city of Fresno. Bless our neighborhood uh, tonight, that God, everywhere we are, as your sons and your daughters, that God, we would be salt and light, and that people would be able to simply taste and see that you are good. We give you glory now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Come on, Lindsay. Thank you, Pastor Phil. So good. I am encouraged in so many ways, thinking a lot about how to embody God's love and how that's going to transform, that transforms us and allow the encouragement and invitation to live out of that. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to thank the family and friends that came to support the dedication today. Thank you all, family, for being here. Um, how cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to go through these announcements pretty quick because I know we're short on time. Um, 
what we got, Pastor Eric? Or... All right, first, uh, if you want to take a picture of this QR code, this is going to link you to our link tree, which is going to tell you what's going on in the life of on-ramps. Um, it's also a link in our social media, but you can go ahead and pull out your camera and click on it, and it will link you to what's going on, um, events coming up. All right, we are a church of QR codes. Um, more QR codes. Here uh, we've got a link to our pastoral search committee survey. So we want to hear from you all as we're in the process um, of, of transition. And so this is a great way to let that search committee know where you're at and what you think we can improve on, what, we're think, what you think we're good at, all that. Um, so please fill that out if you haven't yet. The other one is for the parking lot, digital parking lot. Essentially, it's just a place to express thoughts or ideas or concerns that you have. Uh, so we can, they can be addressed. So another resource. You can, uh, I think they're, are they linked in the link tree as well? Yes. Yeah, they're linked there too. So if you have that first QR code, you're good. All right, next. Karaoke night on Thursday. Woo! This is going to be awesome. Um, it's at Tower Blends on March 14th, uh, 6 to 7.30. If you're interested, talk to Jess or Brandon and uh, they'll give you the scoop. But it's going to be dope. And I hope you all are there. I want to see Jess dance and sing, you know? I saw a preview earlier before service, and I was like, it's going to be, it's going to be fired. All right, next. Um, all right, this is super exciting. Our youth, our high school students have a, like, once in every three years, awesome opportunity to go to a really cool covenant conference um, called Unite. It's happening, like, down in San Diego. They're raising money for it. So uh, their fundraiser, uh, first one coming up is on Saturday, March 30th for a pancake breakfast, um, which is going to be super fun. You can talk to Brandon and Jess if you want to get tickets. They're on sale now. It's going to be $10 per adult, $5 for kids. Um, but yeah, so reach out if you want to go. We'd love to see you there. All right. Women's ministry is having um, a, don't, uh, what's it called? Store, a store, a Saturday store. Um, so we are collecting things like making our own little thrift store, and then people can come in, and they pay for like a bag and get a leave with stuff, which is awesome. So we're going to raise money, and also you can clean out like spring cleaning. They're taking donations now, so if you, you're like thinking about spring cleaning, you got some stuff set aside that you're going to donate anyways, you can just bring it here. Um, so like in good condition, not like trash, but cute stuff. Yeah, the good stuff. Bring it, and then we'll sell it, and that'll be fun. All righty. Okay, and if you haven't done this already, pull out your phone. You can set your alarm to 701 to pray for Lowell, 93701. Uh, pray for Fresno at 559 and pray for on-ramps at 827. Um, and when you do this and your alarm goes off, know that other folks in our community are also praying um, at the same time. So it's a cool way to engage in communal prayer together. All right, more QR codes. Um, ways to give, whole life giving. Um, we can serve in so many ways. You can, there's lots of ways to get involved. But giving financially is also an amazing way to support the mission of OnRamp. So we want to encourage you. Um, you can, we have like a tithe box out there. But you can also use Cash App or Venmo um, to, to tithe um, and support the mission of OnRamps. Keep the lights on, you know. So let's do that. Um, and then you can uh, pray with the elders. If something is on your heart and you want some prayer, we've got our amazing elders on duty, Barb and Jessica over here. Um, you can go over to them afterwards and just ask for a word of prayer um, or with someone you're with. If you just need prayer tonight, please, we encourage you uh, to take the time afterwards to um, get that if you need that. Um, Tuesday night Bible study. Uh, always so good. It's a potluck. Bring your favorite dish, like one that can feed people. I think I'm bringing taco salad this week. Or Filipino spaghetti, one of these two, but it's going to happen. It's going to be great. But so bring your food and let us all enjoy it together. Um, so come, bring a dish, and let's eat together and do Bible study and fellowship midweek. Uh, lastly, we are serving food afterwards out in the cafe areas. So you can go and hang out out there and fellowship, but make sure you grab your chair and hang it up over by LJ. And uh, many hands make light work. So thank you so much. Have a great one on ramps.